Good morning, Life Church. Would you stand up and join us as we sing worship to our God together today?
at this time, we're going to continue in worship by taking communion. If the workers would please come. We just sing this verse that said, To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. That's what Jesus did for us this morning. So we're going to pause just in the midst of this song, even to really deeply reflect upon what he's done for us, not just singing the words, but really thinking it through. Um, as they begin passing it out, you do not have to be a member of Life Church in order to uh, partake in communion. We only ask that you believe the, the words that you've been singing this morning, that you have asked Jesus to be the King of Kings in your life and in your heart this morning. Um, that's really the only requirement for this. You'll be getting a little cup that has um, a wafer in there as well as some juice. And that just represents the body and blood of Jesus. We don't believe that that is literally the body of Jesus or blood of Jesus or that it becomes that. It's just a representation to help us um, as we join together in, a, in one body to remember Jesus' death and resurrection and to look forward to his return together. Um, we're going to be spending just a few moments in silent prayer and reflection. Um, and during that time, I would just ask that you would ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you areas of your life, maybe that um, you have broken relationship with God or perhaps with someone in, in this body. Um, the Bible says very clearly that we are supposed to examine each of our hearts before we take communion so that we don't um, eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. So we'll provide time for that. Um, I'd like to read a scripture that you can spend some time pondering while you pray. This is from Colossians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 18. It says, And he, that's Jesus, is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. So just ponder that, ponder what he's done for you and ask him to make sure that your heart is right with him. Jesus, we thank you for being willing to come to this earth and to live amongst us as a human being, to experience life as we do and yet remain without sin. Thank you for being the perfect example of living a godly life, of living in righteousness. And I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to be ever present and to convict our hearts and point us closer to you. Jesus, as we join together 
as one body. I pray that you would unify us as we partake in this together, that your name would truly be the, the focus of each of our hearts, that we would be able to work together to lift you up and see your name made famous in all the earth. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for us. Let's take of the wafer together, representing the body of Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for your blood that was shed to make atonement for our sins. No other sacrifice that we could have ever hoped to make would be able to perfectly cover over the sins that we commit. Nothing could be long lasting or enough for every person but your blood. So thank you for submitting yourself even onto death on our behalf and shedding your blood so that we might be forgiven. Let's take the juice together to represent Jesus' blood. We're going to continue in this song just singing about the resurrection of Jesus and where we find ourselves in the story. So I would encourage you not to just sing the words, but really take them to heart, having just taken communion, um, remembering what Jesus has done for us. Sing in the morning. In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that storm was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father of Let's sing that again in the morning. In the morning that you rose, all the heaven held its breath. Till that storm. giving of your life for us, God, and God sending your son, Jesus, to come, Lord, to rescue us, to save us, Lord, and today, church, I just encourage us that, man, communion is an awesome time to kind of 
refix the priorities in our life and putting God um, above all. And God um, not only sent Jesus to save us, to be our Savior, but to be our Lord. And oftentimes we just through life, maybe not intentionally, we just kind of get our priorities um, out of line. And so in this prayer time, as we kind of continue with the communion and uh, theme and, and just kind of a personal prayer, um, just want to pray that we would, um, whatever has maybe taken uh, God's place in our life or maybe whatever priorities have, um, you know, taken over his spot, that we could use this time to kind of re align that. So do that with me today, church. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. And Lord, we just pray that you um, would be placed number one in our life. God, that whatever things um, that we've kind of reaffixed um, to take that priority, God, that you would be Lord of all. God, that we would move those things back, that we ourselves would take our step back, Lord, and we would place you as Lord of our life, as King of all kings, that you reign and you rule. Your kingdom rules this world, this earth. God, you created it. You created each one of us, Lord, and we just um, take these moments, God, to give you the things that maybe we've um, allowed to control our lives. God, and sometimes it's just us. We feel like, man, we, we can handle things on our own. We can fix this little issue or fix this little problem we can do we can do this we don't have to take it to every little thing to god but we slowly kind of get um kind of push you to the side and we kind of take that spot so today lord we step back lord and we give you the things that we've tried to control god and we place you priority one in our lives god Holy Spirit, we just pray that you'd move through the rest of this service, God, that you'd speak to each heart, challenge us today, challenge us today, God, speak to us that you are in control, God, and, and we can place these worries, these concerns in your hands, Lord, and you have us, you've got us, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just want to welcome you to Life Church this morning. And it's great to have you all here. And winter is here as well. And we're glad that you have survived the trip. This is actually normal for. North Dakota, after being here a few years. Uh, so unfortunately, this is what we get for being in North Dakota. If you would turn your attention to uh, the bulletin uh, or the paper you received when you walked in this morning, if you're brand new with us today, uh, we thank you for visiting, coming, and we just have a little connect card on the side of your um, bulletin there. If you would just detach that, fill it out, and you could take it to uh, Welcome Desk 1, the first one when you came in uh, the building there. And we just have some more information about the church. We want to uh, thank you for coming and uh, let you know a little bit more of what's going on. If you've been here uh, for a while, the Connect card is our way to communicate with you. So if you have, and if you're new here too, if you have prayer needs that you would like the staff to pray for, uh, you can fill that out, and there's other um, ways that you can communicate with us. Volunteering, just want more information um, about life groups and church stuff. Uh, fill out the Connect card and stick it in the um, offering bucket as it goes by in just a few moments. So, as I said that, if we could have the ushers come forward, and we'll go ahead and receive the um, tithes and offerings today. This is just another way that we can worship the Lord um, with our giving, giving back a, a portion of what he's blessed us with. And so as the offering buckets come by, you can uh, place your stuff in there, or there's other ways that you can give as on the 
um, screen there. So let's pray and we'll receive this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, God, we love you and we pray that you would, uh, we just continue to praise you and exalt you and place you in priority in our life, God, with our finances. God, we invest into your kingdom today. Would you bless the ministries that it goes to and um, the things that they do? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Watch the screens for the announcements this week. Good morning, Life Church. I'm Pastor Sam, and I want to invite you to the Life Group Leaders Lunch that's happening after services today. If you're even just thinking about leading a life group this spring, I encourage you to join us. It's just an informal, informational meeting over lunch to find out more about what it's like to lead a life group at Life Church. Today is the last day to turn in the forms for the Winter Bible Reading Challenge. To do that, you can either turn in the form to the welcome desk in the lobby, or you can turn in the total number of Bible chapters you read in the month of January on the Life Church app under Events. The results will be tallied and announced next Sunday on the 14th. I'm so excited for that, and I hope you are too. Good morning, Life Church. We have just a few weeks left until Men's Retreat, so if you haven't signed up yet, go to ndmen.org/events. We have a few spots available for traveling and lodging, so go sign up at Welcome Desk One. We're going to be leaving Thursday, February 25th at 5:15 p.m. If you have any more questions about this event, go to Welcome Desk One. On February 28th, that's a Sunday, we're going to be launching the next Alpha course. Alpha is a series of sessions that explores the basics of the Christian faith. We always have food, watch a video, and then spend a bit of time discussing that video. If you're interested in signing up to be a part of that Alpha course, you can do so on the Life Church app, and there will be further sign-ups available later this month, so be on the lookout for those. Lots of awesome things happening at Life Church coming up in the near future, huh? Uh, today, just to reiterate what was already said in the announcement, uh, today's the day to turn in your forms for the Winter Bible Reading Challenge because we're going to be tallying those totals and announcing it next Sunday. So I'm super happy, super excited for that. And as I, as I said in the announcement, I hope you are too. We're trying to reach that 5,000 total chapters read, that collective total, together. And so I'm, I'm really excited to, to see the, the grand total that we came up with together. And then Alpha, as you see, is coming up on the 28th. That's just a great time to kind of explore just kind of the big questions of life and uh, to, to explore topics like, is there more to life than this? And does God still heal today? So be on the lookout for those sign-ups. You could sign up on the app even today. It'll be an awesome time together. Well, of course, today is Super Bowl Sunday, so happy Super Bowl Sunday, everyone. I'm excited for uh, Tom Brady to lose and because <laughs> he has enough Super Bowl rings, right? It's, uh, it's time for good old Tommy boy to play nice and start sharing with the rest of the class. And uh, I, so I'm, I'm pulling for the Chiefs today. I, I think Mahomes could, could deserve another Super Bowl ring. Any Chiefs fans in here? Anybody, okay, a couple, a few, yeah, there we go, all right, well, I think it'll be a good game regardless, it'll be, it'll be a fun one to watch. Uh, well, I'm Pastor Sam, I'm the discipleship pastor here, I'm filling in for our lead pastor, Pastor Chris, this morning, and uh, we're going to continue the series that he started last week called Not Afraid, and we kind of talked about finding security in who God says we are, and more importantly, whose we are, right, and that is that we are we are God's. We are his children. We can find security and we can find confidence in that. So we're going to continue that Not Afraid series. And I thought it'd be cool to kind of kick things off with a story. Now, I don't know about you. You love a good story maybe. Maybe you had parents, a mom and dad who were awesome storytellers or a grandparent. Perhaps your grandpa would sit you down on his lap when you were a kid and uh, you, would, you would look up at him and just with wide eyes and He's just an awesome storyteller. Maybe you have fond memories of that. Well, I'm not saying I'm an awesome storyteller, but I'm going to give it a shot, okay? So here's a story from uh, when I was younger. I was doing my summer internship in South Dakota, and I was staying at a guest house over the summer. Some, uh, a member of the church had kind of opened up a, a house they had on the side to my, me, and so it was you know, an unfamiliar place. 
and I was just kind of unfamiliar surroundings, and I'm back from work one night, just getting ready for bed, trying to, uh, you know, brush my teeth, and then I hit the sack, right? Um, I'm in bed, I'm trying to doze off, and what should happen, but all of a sudden, I hear this noise, and if I had ears that could stick up straight, they would, because like a dog, right? I'm, I'm like, wait, what was, what was that? What's going on? And then I'm pretty sure I, I saw some sort of shadow flash across the curtains. There was like a, a light post outside, and so there's some light filtering in. And that's when I really got concerned. I was like, man, what, what is going on outside of my bedroom window? So I get out of the covers. I grab my pocket knife. I, 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 lock, I lock the door, and I, I, I run to the other side of the bed away from the door, and I, I kind of crouch down there, and I'm like, man, what is, what is going on? I'm, you know, my, heart, my heart's uh, uh, beating a little bit faster. Uh, I'm breathing a little harder. And I've got my knife. I don't know if it was a knife or if, like, I, I grabbed a belt or something. I don't know. Like, if, in case anybody comes in, <laughs> I'm going to be ready, right? They're going to they're gonna get a whooping. And, uh, <laughs> guys, I, I, I crouched there next to my bed for probably over an hour. And I was <laughs> just wide-eyed looking at the window like, what, what's that? What's going to happen, you know? You know what I'm pretty sure it was? Pretty sure it was the garbage bin lid outside of the bedroom window. It was either that or a bunch of horses that were making some commotion in a nearby, nearby pen. And you know what the embarrassing thing is? This only happened a few years ago. So, <laughs> I guess you could say I've come a long way since then, uh, especially because I have a gun now and not just a pocket knife. America. All right, well, uh, all, that, all that story to say, uh, it, it's normal to get spooked occasionally, right? Maybe some of us, like me in that instance, took it a little out of proportion, maybe, maybe right? Uh, it's, it's normal to get frightened and uh, for something to scare you. That's, it's an appropriate response to some things, an appropriate reaction. Anyone have that sibling who hides behind the door and then when you walk past, he spooks you, you know? <laughs> maybe you have that annoying younger sibling or, or older brother or something. Here's the thing. It becomes a problem when we let fear control our lives. I, I think you could agree on, on that. It becomes a problem when we live our whole life out of fear, and we let anxiousness and worry dwell inside of us. I'm sure you could agree that having those feelings isn't pleasant. And I, I think, though, it describes a lot of us, even some of us here today, some of you watching online, and how we go through each day. So let's take a look at another story in the Bible in Exodus chapter 3. And I'd like to show you through some, some different Bible passages this morning a particular reason that we don't have to live in fear. Besides the fact that we're children of God, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that and what, what that means. So before we start reading in Exodus 3, I want to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of context to what's happening at this point in the Bible, right? We're uh, I got my I got a big thick Bible up here, uh, and I'm pretty thin. I'm at the beginning, so not a ton has happened, but also a lot has happened. Genesis has 50 chapters, and and uh, we're we're here in Exodus three. So at this point, there's this guy Moses. You may be familiar with his name. He's a pretty major Bible character, uh, but he is a Hebrew who was through some unique circumstances raised in Pharaoh's household. Uh, but the, his, his people, his, the rest of the Hebrews, the rest of the Israelites, were slaves in Egypt and had been for quite some time. And one day Moses is walking along and he sees this Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. That didn't make him happy. He took things out of proportion and ended up killing the Egyptian. Well, of course, that didn't make anything good or right. So Moses ends up running away to this place called Midian. He finds a wife. He gets a job tending his father-in-law's flock, maybe some sheep, maybe some goats. So he's out in the wilderness, tending this flock one day, and let's read what happens. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, Yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So here, 
here Moses, maybe you can kind of imagine, he's, he's wandering around, maybe it's a little bit of a, of a dry area, it says it's a wilderness, right? And he comes up over this ridge and he sees this green thing, this bush in the distance. He notices it's on fire. And huh, that's kind of weird, just a random bush on fire. And the more he looks at it, he realizes, huh, it's on fire, but he's, he's kind of talking to himself here, if you notice that. It's on fire, but it's not being burned up. So he kind of talks to himself and says, well, I'll, I'll go check it out. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And he says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So what's going on here? Moses hears this voice come out of this burning bush that he's looking at. And that must have been pretty surprising, right? To hear, to hear the voice of God speak to him out of the bush. And the first thing God does is, is he, said, he identifies his holiness and, and says, take off your sandals uh, uh, don't come near, this is, this is a holy place, this is holy ground. And then the next thing he does is he identifies the self, himself. I'm the God of your ancestors, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moses realizes that, he responds in fear because he was afraid to look at God. He, he hid his face. And rightly so, uh, we see in the Bible that since humans are unholy, we're, we're impure, we have a sinful nature, a tendency to do wrong, and God is so holy, God's extreme holiness prevents us humans from being able to look at him fully without dying. We can't look at God fully without us dying, because that's how holy God is. So Moses was right to be afraid and to hide his face in that instance, because he probably didn't want to die. All right, verse 11. Here's what happens. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He, being God, said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So Moses has questions. He's, he's asking, uh, well, who am I? You know, he's probably thinking, I'm just out here watching these dumb sheep out in the middle of nowhere, right? Who am I to, to do this? Who, who am I to, to, to bring, lead the people out of, slavery, out of slavery? Egypt is a pretty powerful nation at this point in history. And God's response is interesting. He doesn't say, well, don't worry, I'm going to wipe them out for you. I mean, that's kind of what happens. But what, he, his, his, what, resp what his response is, is that I will be with you. But Moses, what a guy, he has more questions, all right? Verse 13, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, it's interesting to note that at this point in history, the Israelites didn't really know much about God. They, had, they didn't have the whole Bible written out for them and to know what God was like. And furthermore, they didn't know what his name was. So Moses, when he's saying, okay, so let's say I go, and they ask me, who sent you? What's your name? What am I even supposed to call you? Who is this God of our ancestors? What is he like, and what is his name? And God's response, I am who I am. Now, to us, reading this in English might seem a little confusing, maybe. Like, well, what? That's not a name. That's a sentence, right? Seems a little cryptic, a little vague or mysterious, perhaps. 
But here's the thing. It's from this phrase that we get the Hebrew word Yahweh. Maybe you're a little more familiar with that term. And another important aspect of that is that I am is in present tense. It's not, God's not saying, oh, I was who I was or I have been who I have been. He's saying I am who I am. In other words, by this name, God is saying, I want to be known as the God who is present and active. He's not a God who's distant and uninterested or unreachable. Rather, he's the God who's near, who's close. He's involved and he's caring. He's the God who knows you and who desires to be known. Now, Moses... I don't know if he's just a scaredy cat or what, but he keeps giving excuses. And we're not going to keep reading, but here's basically what happens. He's he's seemingly afraid to go back to Egypt. God says in the following verses, okay, you know, I'm going to send you, and they're going to listen to you. And I I love it. This is rich. Moses says, oh, but God, they're not going to listen to me. They won't believe me. And, And earlier he was saying, who am I? I'm just a shepherd. Yeah, the God of the universe is talking to you, dude. I think you should believe that they're going to believe you. Uh, and then, so, so God addresses that. He responds, okay. But then Moses says, oh, but God, I'm just, I'm not good at talking. Okay, maybe Moses, you know, just wasn't the most persuasive speaker. Maybe, maybe he kind of stumbled over his words. Maybe he had a stuttering problem. I don't, I don't know exactly what Moses' issue there, but he says he's not good at talking. So Moses, or, or so God addresses that issue. But then Moses is just like, well, God, can't you just can't you just send someone else? And God's response to that is that, hey, Moses, I'm going to be with you. Specifically, that he would be with his mouth. And I thought that was a little bit humorous because often we say, oh, Godspeed or may God be with you, but we never say, may God be with your mouth. <laughs> but God here is, is addressing Moses' concerns and saying, hey, I'm going to be with you, and since you're worried about talking, I'll be with your mouth specifically, right? One application that we can draw from this is that because God has identified himself and, and chosen to be the God who, who is present and active and involved in our lives, our response is to, in turn, be close to God and get involved with what he's doing. It's something for you to think about, but we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to Matthew 1, 23, go to a New Testament passage, and we're going to continue on this topic a little bit. Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is talking about, as you may know, the birth of of Jesus Christ, God's son. It's talking about Jesus coming to the earth from heaven and dwelling on the earth. In other words, God's nearness was now visible in the flesh. That's how much God wanted to be a present and active God. Have you ever thought about it that way? That God wanted to be so involved with us that he even sent his own son to live amongst us in the flesh. And that's the Christmas story, right, is the birth of Jesus and what we celebrate at that time. So we see here that Emmanuel, at the end of the verse, says they should call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So we still see this, this, this continuation of God being a God who is with us, right? He's, he's still the God after, after all this time through the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament. He's still the God who is present, and who is active in our lives. One other passage in Matthew is chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. This is at the end of Jesus' life. He's, he's uh, been crucified, and he was raised from the dead, and he's about to ascend into heaven. But before he ascends into heaven, he's, he's talking with his disciples And he's giving them some instructions. Here's what he says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is saying, hey, hey guys, I'm going to, you know, he's about to leave them. He's about to ascend into heaven. 
But he's giving them some instructions and saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. And so he tells them. And then after that, he gives them an assurance saying, okay, but as you're going and doing that, as you're going and as you're making disciples, don't worry, don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. He makes that promise. He gives them that assurance. And finally, in Acts 2, chapter 2, just another instance, almost a culmination of this story that we're discovering. This is after Jesus has ascended into heaven, and the believers are gathered in one place. It says, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to each of them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what's happening here. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit on the believers. This is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to be with his disciples. He sent his Holy Spirit. Jesus left, but in, in his place, he sent the Holy Spirit. That's the third person of the Trinity, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. And in that, Jesus' promise, I am with you, is fulfilled. The Holy Spirit indwelling the believers and making, making their bodies a, a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens to me, and that's what happens to you when you accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, God's presence fills the earth, right? We call that his omnipresence. He's everywhere at the same time. And sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around that because nothing else is like that. And, you know, I think the closest thing might be uh, air or water. It's kind of like all over. We're all breathing air right now. But even air stops where the water begins. And in space, there, it's, it's, a, it's a vacuum. There is no air. So nothing else is like God in this way. He's, he's everywhere in the far corners of the universe, in the billions of galaxies. God's everywhere. He's omnipresent. And yet that awesome God, when someone chooses to accept him as their Lord and Savior, his, his Holy Spirit comes to dwell within that person. Now, from what we've read in these passages about God being with us, I think we can establish this. And if you're if you're taking notes, if you if you remember anything from from what we've what we've been talking about here today, here it is. When we are in right relationship with God, his presence, his nearness, it drives out fear. When we are in right relationship with God, his presence drives out fear. Over and over again in the Bible, we see God's presence with his people being a deterrent of fear. Some examples, Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Psalm 23.4, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Joshua 1.9, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Deuteronomy 31.6, do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Psalm 118, 6, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. Over and over again, God's presence with us, his nearness, his closeness with us, the, the indwelling of his Holy Spirit is a deterrent of fear. And we're going to start to wrap things up this morning, and let's focus on one of two things, okay? Number one, maybe, maybe you're here this morning or watching online, and you're a believer, you consider yourself a Christian, and you're, you're, you're saved by grace and living for Jesus, but you're still living that life of fear. What's happening is you're letting fear control your thoughts and your actions, ultimately your everyday life. It's exhausting to live that way. And you just need to spend some time recognizing the presence of God in you and around you. Maybe you haven't drawn close to God like you should. He wants to know you intimately, closely. He's the God who is with you, the God who is present. The Bible says we, we can't even escape his presence. There's nowhere we can, we can run from his spirit. God is there. 
Number two, maybe you don't consider yourself a Christian. You just, you don't know God that way. And you haven't accepted Jesus into your life. You haven't submitted to him as, as your Lord and your Savior. But you feel a tug in your heart, some sort of, some sort of prompting in your chest. And you also are tired of, of living that life of fear. And you want God to, to change that. You want him to, to turn your life around and to be with you through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. So he's with you in that way. His, his Spirit indwells you. So we're going to close and wrap those things up. If one of those two things apply to you, I invite you to, to come to the altar. We're going to take some time spending, spending time in, in God's presence. And I encourage you to, as you respond, to listen and see what God is, is saying to you. Take a moment to, to just recognize the fact that, that God's here in this room and that God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you. So as Chloe begins singing, I invite you to come now. If one of those two things apply to you, uh, pastoral staff and board members, if you'd make yourselves available to just lay a hand on a shoulder or, or pray with someone. stands against you you are with me I find it so amazing that when we consider the the magnitude of God when we consider how 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 big he actually is we've been talking about his presence and that he's he's everywhere at the same time he's also all-knowing 
He, he knows that there's nothing he doesn't know. God who created every tree in the world, God who created every planet, every star in the sky, that that, that God would zoom down to this, this little, little round ball called the earth. And with all the billions of people in it, that he, he would choose to be a God who, who desires to be, to be with us. Do you understand how, how amazing that is? That the Egyptians and, and all, the, all the other tribes and nations of that time, they had their own idols, they had their own gods that they worshiped, but there wasn't a God like this. There wasn't a God who was, who was with his people like this, who was as powerful as that God. So I'm just, I'm just in awe of, of how, how great a God it is that we serve. And maybe, maybe you're having trouble admitting that you're, 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 you're living a life of fear, that you're letting it control you. And sometimes there, there are things that we have to be cautious about. But it doesn't deserve to have a place in our hearts when we are living for Jesus and filled with his Holy Spirit. So I encourage you as you go about the rest of the day and the rest of the week to, to ponder these things, to take time throughout each day to, to recognize just the fact, maybe, maybe in silence, maybe through prayer, that God is here with you. And you can't run away from him. to respond to that with thankfulness and with drawing near to him. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that you desire to have a relationship with us, that you desire to know us and for us to know you. We're, we're grateful that you are, you are that kind of God. You're the one and only true God. So we thank you for who you are thank you for what you've done and what you will do. I pray that you would speak to us throughout the rest of this week and that we would listen attentively and respond in obedience to what you would have us do. I pray that you would bless each person here as they uh, go home and go about the rest of the rest of their week that you would lavish your blessings upon them so that they can be a blessing to others as well. Would you draw us near to you? And we thank you once again for just how much you love us, how much you, you care. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week, everyone. We're fishing a little bit early. Go out and grab your kids and, and uh, go Chiefs. <laughs>